Hello and welcome to Human. It is so nice to see you all here. Welcome to our first evening event of the week. Um, human is a oh, human is a um, a sequence of events um, hosted by Durham Christian Union. And we're hoping it's going to be a space where we're able to share our experiences of life, faith, and humanity. Whoever you are um, here tonight, you are so welcome with us. We hope you've enjoyed the wine, canapes, and music this evening. But we've got loads more to look forward to tonight. So I want to introduce myself. My name's Charlie. I'm a third year at Hatfield studying English literature. And I'm Naomi. I'm also a third year at Castle studying physics. And I just want to say a quick thank you to the Wayfarers who played us in. They were incredible. Um, and also a big thank you to um, the guys who have spent the whole afternoon preparing canapes. You guys are so appreciated. Um, so this week we're thinking about what it means to be human. And I don't know about you guys, but I find the human body pretty amazing. I heard this fact earlier today, which is actually pretty nuts if you think about it or try to do it yourself. So did you know that babies can swallow and breathe at the same time? They can eat and drink and breathe at the same time, which is amazing. And I tell you, if you're trying to do that now, trust me, you can't. Um, and we've also got a few other facts that we found out today. So here are a few questions for you. Number one, across the course of your life, you will shed a surprising amount of skin cells. But do we shed the equivalent weight of A, 40 Paddy pieces, B, 60 Paddy pieces, or C, 80. That's weight, the equivalent weight of the amount of skin that we shed over the course of our lifetime. Turn to the person next to you. What do you reckon? 40, 60, or 80 Paddy pieces? The answer is in fact C, 80 Paddy That is 40 kilograms. 40 kilograms of dead skin is half my weight. That is a lot. That's a lot of dead skin. Second question. You have many, many miles of blood vessels in your body. If you stretch them out end to end, capillaries, veins, arteries, how many times could they stretch from this tent all the way to Jobo? From this tent all the way to Jobo. Answer A. I think it's that way. Um, 25,000 times. 75,000 times, or 100,000 times, if you laid all your blood vessels end to end up to Jogo. How many times? Thank you. The answer is an amazing 75,000 times, which is 60,000 miles, which is two and a half times around the world, all inside your body, which is pretty amazing. And our final one. Um, so your, your heart pumps millions of litres of blood through it during your lifetime, but in one day, what is the volume of blood that passes through your heart um, in wine bottles? Okay, A, is it 10,000 bottles of wine, B, 7,000 bottles of wine, or C, 6,000? That's, that's um, volume of blood that pumps through your heart every day. 10,000, 7,000, 6,000. Either way, it's 10,000. Okay, the answer is A, 10,000 bottles of wine. That is 7,500 litres of blood through your heart every single day. Wow, I feel a little lightened. Um, before we move on to the rest of our evening, we've just got a few practicalities um, to run past you guys. If at any time during the evening you need the toilet, just out that back door, um, round the side of the entrance tunnel, there's a few glamorous porta which you're welcome to use um, if you would like. And in the event of a fire, we hit the dollar fire, but in the event of a fire, there are fire exits through um, to the cafe on either side, at the back of the marquee either side, and to my left. Um, if there is a fire, just follow the wardens who are in, the stewards who are in, nice human jumpers. Um, but yeah. Hopefully that won't happen, and we can enjoy the rest of our evening together. Guaranteed that if I, if I doesn't happen, we will next be having um, Nat up on stage. She will be, um, she's a student here from Durham. She will be interviewing our guest, John Napton. Um, we'll then have a short break before Mark comes to help us explore some of Jesus' teachings. We'll be um, opening the Bible together and engaging with what Jesus has to say um, about our humanity. So 
basically, I just want to say, it doesn't matter whether you've read any of the Bible before, or whether you know it well, whether you're here and you're sceptical or intrigued, you are so welcome, and um, we just really want to encourage you to engage with what it's said up here tonight, um, to listen, to um, think hard about it, and to discuss your opinions with each other afterwards. But now on to the next lot of our evening. Nat, can I welcome you up? Let's give a hand for Nat Nat. <laughs> Nat, lovely to be with us. Uh, can you give us your Durham statistics very quickly? Yes, um, I'm a third year. I'm studying theology and I'm at Nilda. Yes. And Nat, can you tell me the times today, the times today when you felt most human, when you were most aware of your humanity? Right. Um, I've got two. One is not so good and one is better. Um, the first not so good one is I had 13 alarms set for this morning <laughs> and, and none of them went off. And an hour and 20 minutes later, I got a call from a friend who I'd given a code red alert to. If I, if I hadn't texted her, she had to ring me. So I got woken up an hour and 20 minutes later. That wasn't so good. Um, not felt not great. Later, I got a text from a friend celebrating our two-year friend anniversary on Facebook. We met in the cafe at the back two years ago, so that was quite fun. Nice. Well, I'm glad you're with us tonight. We haven't set too many alarms. Um, we'll hand over to you now. Wonderful, thanks. Um, yeah, so Human is about sharing our experiences of life, faith, and humanity. And each evening in this time, I'm going to be interviewing different individuals, and they're going to be sharing parts of their stories. And after that, we're going to be hearing a story that Jesus told. And tonight, I'm really excited to be chatting to John Napton. He is a professor, um, a leading expert in structural engineering, and he is a leading expert in that for the last 25 years and has lectured at Newcastle University for 10 years. And um, some of his major work has involved some of the catastrophic events that have happened, such as 9-11 and the Grenfell Tower disasters. And he's been asked to advise on those things. So I would love you guys to give a warm welcome to John. Why don't you come on up? Sort of, were a sort of Durham student. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, you might think this is a bit of a, a, a strong claim, really, but I was at Newcastle University in the 1960s. You might not know this, but Newcastle University in the 1960s was King's College Durham. I was the first year who was allowed to uh, choose between a Durham degree and a Newcastle degree, and I chose Newcastle. <laughs> So tell us a bit about Newcastle. You've obviously went to uni there and now live there. What is it like? I live in Whitley Bay and uh, I love it. I do have a place in London and I have to say I love that as well. There's only two places in Britain I really enjoy being. It's uh, Tyneside and London. And on the train between them uh, really is quite tedious all the way. Except Durham. <laughs> Good answer. And then um, when you were brought up, do you, were you chatting earlier, you said you had you weren't brought up with any faith or anything, and then you came to uni, to Newcastle slash Durham Uni, and you sort of first um, heard about this personal relationship with Jesus. Yeah, I didn't really have much faith as a, a youngster in Rotherham, where I grew up, because I went to the Church of England. Um, but when I came to, uh, to, to university, at the end of my first year, and by the way, I'm now a 50th year student, but at the end of my first year, I actually had a life-changing experience and I actually, it's an old fashioned term, to, but, but in, in once I was converted, I became a Christian. I, I learned to understand my personal relationship with Jesus. And um, what did you find the most attractive thing about Jesus? Um, uh, it's, it's changed as things have gone on. Now it's the peace in this complex and often frightening world I inhabit. Um, it's my oasis of peace. It's the place I can come back to when it's all too much. At the time, it was exciting. Uh, it was uh, a purpose in life for the first time. But I've evolved. And the problem I've got, I've never, as a real adult, not been a Christian. So I can't tell the difference. But, but, but I've never regretted it for a minute. Most things in life let you down sooner or later. Um, my faith as a believer in Jesus never has done that. So this all happened at university, and then you, you left uni, and you went to start teaching at one point at Newcastle, whilst also doing structural engineering. Can you sort of explain how those two things 
came about? Yeah, um, you wouldn't find it all at all surprising if I were a medic and I'd spent half my life in, in clinical practice and the other half in academia. That's quite natural. The same is true in engineering. Uh, we try to develop a career uh, in which we uh, practice, uh, which means we are designing buildings, managing the process, and then later in life now, I tend to be uh, sorting out all the problems that buildings get. As you go on, you sort of become a bit of an expert, and the lawyers like to use you to try to win their cases in court. There's some bad things go on in the world of civil engineering. And you're doing that alongside also teaching? Yeah, yeah I, I still do some teaching, um, but uh, I, I find now that uh, I confine that to, uh, to, to rare events. Uh, and, uh, but I do enjoy it. The best time of my life has been when I've been teaching at Newcastle. And uh, it's simply because the students have kept me, kept me young. And, and they've, uh, they I, th I think you forget this when you're at university as a student. You are teaching the academics far more than they're teaching you. And um, after 9-11 in Grenfell, you were called up to give some advice on that. Can you explain a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, um, the 9-11 the, the uh, Twin Towers, I was employed by the insurers of the Twin Towers, Lloyds of London. And the problem they had is they needed to know whether they should consider the attack on the Twin Towers to be one event or two. By this, they meant if one aircraft had hit one tower, would the other tower have collapsed? The reason they asked that question is because some people have been saying that the two towers shared common foundations. In fact, they didn't. So I was able to advise them that, in fact, there were truly uh, two events. Now, the benefit from Lloyd's of London's point of view was that this meant they could apply the excess to the policy twice. This meant that they reduced the payment that they had to make to rebuild those towers by 10 million pounds rather than the 5 million pounds, which would have been the case had it been one event. And were you called up as well for Grenfell? Was that similar? Uh, uh, not by anyone in official capacity, but I, I, I do a lot of work for the BBC. And uh, on the morning after the night of the fire at Grenfell, uh, the BBC and the Daily Telegraph put to me the question, is the tower going to fall down? They, they recalled the Twin Towers, how they collapse. And the Grenfell Tower, at, this is nine o'clock in the morning, was still standing. And they asked me, is it going to fall down? I said, no, it's not. Uh, I was able to say that because at the time it was built, the UK building regulations had meant that our buildings were particularly robust. Um, those kind of questions are quite difficult to answer because as a consequence of that answer, the fireman went in. And so you were actually giving an answer, and you often have to do this as an engineer. It may seem quite an ordinary thing, but often people's lives depend upon your, your ability to get it right, but, and you only have one shot. How do you find that sort of sense of responsibility? Um, it's not something I enjoy, um, but again, my, my, my faith uh, comes to the rescue when things get difficult. If this happens, for example, in the witness box, if I'm giving evidence, and there's some barrister getting a little bit aggressive, it's good to know that you've got a sound foundation to build your life on. It's really crucial. And, and with those disasters, obviously, you're facing and experiencing the best and the worst aspects of humanity in the midst of those things. How do you find that experience? Um, I don't know all the answers. But there's a, a lovely account in the book of Job. It, it, there's a, there's a, the book of Job's brilliant. Bad things have happened to this man Job for no apparent reason. And he questions God and he says, God, why has this happened? Why have you done all this to me? And he says to Job, he says, look, were you there when I built the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I laid the cornerstone of the universe? Who are you to question me? So when, when I see these things, I have to accept, I don't know the answer, but God essentially is telling mankind, we are not in a position where we would understand, even if we try to explain, but we have to trust him and expect that in the fullness of time, we will one day understand. But I, I don't have an answer to those issues. 
I think you perhaps had just answered this, but my question was going to be, how do you sort of reconcile those tragedies with your faith? Um, I have agonies. Um, I, 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 I find the longer I live, the less certain I am of everything except my faith. And I have to come back to that every time. I couldn't do the job I'm doing. Even simple things, uh, we, we are often having to design structures. If you're designing a bridge and you get it wrong, a lot of bad things are going to happen. And, and it's, a, it, it's quite a stressful occupation at times. But I couldn't do it without knowing I have a firm sort of foundation in life. You talk sort of a lot about this, um, your firm foundation of faith. And you've also obviously got the fact that you are um, in the field of science. How do you, do you see those in conflict or how do you hold those two together? Oh, I think science is absolutely fabulous. Um, I, 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 I hold them together because science is about discovery. It's a, philo it's a philosophy, it's a way of approaching uh, knowledge and, and, and thereby come to new knowledge. And to my mind, uh, if someone truly believes in a creator God, the more that we discover, the more that we discover about that creator God. I, I think there are two books that God's written. One is the Bible, and the other is the natural world, both of which speak massively of his personality. Are there, there are times when um, either your job or what you, you see in science um, has been challenging to your faith? How have you sort of dealt with those things? Um, I, I, no, I, I think the main thing that's challenged my faith is sometimes the behaviour of my fellow Christians, quite frankly. You know? um, I, I mean, I, I, I look at the way we sometimes get entrenched in the past and become sometimes irrelevant to the modern world, and I get a little bit depressed. Um, I, I feel that the more we engage with the world and the more, the more um, we, we recognize the times we live in, the more we're going to bring the truth of God to people. Our church has recently started meeting in the local pub. We run the pub quiz and we have a discussion group called 42 and we find that to be the most, uh, the most uh, beneficial thing we are doing in our community in Whitley Bay right now. What sort of thing would you say to people who are investigating um, Jesus and claims of, of that and him? What would you say to them? Um, I, I, I say that uh, do that, please do that, but do it, do it properly. Don't pretend to do it and really say that because you're really too lazy to think deeply. Think deeply about it, come to your own conclusion, and I would respect whatever conclusion you, you do come to because there are very intelligent people in the world who believe and very intelligent people who don't believe. So I don't think it reflects badly or well according to the conclusion you draw, but all I can say in my experience is I don't think I could have been, um, uh, I couldn't have been as, as, as uh, I've had a, a successful life in the sense that it's a brilliant life. I just love every moment of it and I've never regretted it for once. I know a lot of people, both Christians and non-Christians, who can't say that. So I don't think there's any, um, any way you can say you're a better person as a Christian, but I've just found it to be a, a, an amazing journey, and one, I would take exactly that same decision I took when I was 18, I would take it now. And looking back at that, that journey that you've had from 18 at uni, which is a lot of, um, a lot of people here, maybe first year or um, exploring, to now, what has that whole journey been like? Um, what has been the hard and the, the good bits of that? Yeah. I mean, look at me carefully, because one day you'll be me in 50 <laughs> years' time. Um, oh, uh, it, it, it's, 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 life is never a steady uh, journey. Life always has surprises around the corner, and there's lots of things that uh, are, are, uh, you can't plan for. Um, but again, uh, when things have happened surprisingly and bad things have happened, I, I've been able to just take the view, well, uh, there's, there has to, there, there, there's got to be a reason for this. this. This is part of a plan. And the fact that I can't see the end game um, is why I'm struggling to understand it. I think we all have to agree that, uh, that, that life is quite frightening in some ways. We have to just ensure that the, the good parts overwhelm the difficult parts and uh, I, I've just found that life has been uh, very kind to me 
although there have been times when I didn't think so at the time. And a lot of, of what you shared sounds like there are, there are questions that maybe aren't always answered, perhaps whether that's in the face of those disasters or um, with faith or science. What does it look like for you to, um, in your profession, but also your, your own life, to, to hold questions, to have them, some which maybe are answered and some which aren't? <coughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I think I think every time we get up in the morning, uh, we, we write a new chapter of our book, and and who knows, uh, you know, people will say, well, look, you're in your late sixties now, aren't you getting a bit fed up? You've had most of your life, and I say, I don't know, um, I, 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 this is the best time of my life. Uh, I, you know, when you get older, you think. Oh, I wish I was l younger again because I'd have all that life ahead of me. But when you're young, you've got all sorts of fears. You don't know where your life's going. I can look back now, and and you know it's like like when you you, you get towards the end of a novel, um, you you can you, you can kind of enjoy that part more because it's rather nice to reach the end. And in a sense, I'm not fearful of reaching the end of my life. Uh, I, I I I expect I fully expect there to be an afterlife. I, I can't see any any sense, any scientific sense in my being just, just being extinguished. So I'm looking forward to many of the things I don't understand becoming revealed to me uh, in, after I die. And, and I know uh, some people find that strange. I'm not looking forward to dying because it's a fabulous life I have. Um, uh, it, 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 Tonight I was tempted to bring my Land Rover Defender because I was told it was muddy in the car park. I chose to not in the end, um, but there's that kind of thing I'll miss when I die. Um, but 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 the the the, the thought of uh, spending eternity in heaven with my Maker, I believe, is the real true life. This is just a temporary um, sort of uh, interlude, which is is here for a reason I don't quite understand, but it's a, a part of our eternal well-being that we experience the issues that beset us in this life. And, and those things that you share must be quite different to some of your contemporaries in science and who you work with or um, who you maybe interview on BBC and things like that. How, what does that look like for you? I never take the view that I have to be an apologist for God. Um, if I get into a discussion where people question uh, my faith, I immediately go on the attack and ask them to give me one piece of evidence for atheism, because I've not encountered one yet. So I, I, I simply put them under the same sort of pressure some people would expect me to put them. Because I think if someone's going to claim to be an atheist, I want to see some evidence that they've researched it. I don't just want to, to, to encounter people who feel that they can get away with saying that. I feel I should be able to describe to people I encounter uh, why I'm a Christian when they want to know. And likewise, if someone's going to take an opposite view, I want to question that person. I, I, I want to interrogate the, 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 the evidence upon which that's based. And I've not seen any. No one's given me any. And um, we're just going to have to close a minute. So my final question is, who is Jesus to you today? Um, Jesus is, is simply my, my structure. Um, if we build a building, the first thing we build is the structure. We then hang everything from that structure. Um, without Jesus, I have no structure in my life. Um, I'm just a, a wandering, uh, sort of a wandering star. And, and with, 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 with Jesus in my life, he is actually my structural framework that gives the rest of my life, the bits that everyone sees, it gives them some purpose and some uh, stability and some, uh, uh, so, so, some strength and so on. Without Jesus, my entire career would have been worthless. Thank you so much, John. That is all so interesting. I'm going to invite Naomi up now, who's going to share us about the next part of the evening. But let's give a round of applause for John.
um, and move on to the next part of our evening. So do find your friends and grab your seats, finish off your canapes. So having heard from John about his experience of faith, we're going to spend some time now um, having a look at Jesus, this human who has impacted so many. Have a look at what he says about our humanity. And like I said before, if you're here and you've never really heard much about the Bible before, maybe you've read a little bit of it and you're not convinced, maybe you've read some of it and you're intrigued, maybe you're just here because you want to find out more, um, can I encourage you to listen hard, to think for yourself, to um, spend some time after the talk discussing with others around you about what you thought. Um, and this, this whole week, so we have the... Um, the pleasure of having a guy called Mark up with us. He's up from Maidenhead. Um, he, amongst other things, works for a Christian charity across Europe and the Caribbean. Um, and he's a chaplain in Whitehall. Um, so yeah, without further ado, Mark, would you like to join me? Um, Mark, tell me, tell us a bit about yourself. Good evening. Um, I'm uh, married to Rachel. We've got two kids. Uh, Josh, who's a first year at uni, and uh, Anna, who's year 12, uh, just starting out her A levels. And uh, we just we lived in London for 12 years, but moved out to Maidenhead just last summer. So we're just getting into that now. Great, great. Um, so Mark each night is going to be taking us through um, a different story that Jesus told. If you have a look on your tables or on your seats, um, you should find a book that looks a bit like this. It's sort of like blue colour, a little human thumbprints on it. Um, this is a historical account. This is a biography of Jesus' life written by a guy who met the eyewitnesses. Um, as you can probably tell, it's written by a man called Luke. Um, and uh, this is like one of just one of the books from the Bible. Today we're going to be in um, page 28. Let me turn to page 28. We're going to be looking at the story of the Good Samaritan. And by the way, these, um, these little books are a gift from the Christian Union to you. We would love for you to take them away, continue to read, and continue to, to question and challenge and highlight and write notes, um, and to yeah, kind of investigate the claim to Jesus written in here. So from towards the bottom of page 28, um, the subtitle, The Parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll read it for us. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going on the same, down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to, came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, it's great to be here tonight. And uh, I would love it if you could keep that open in front of you um, and uh, check that what I'm saying comes from the words of Jesus because he is the reason we're doing this whole uh, week. He's our motivation. Um, and but perhaps you're thinking, why on earth listen to this guy who you know lived 2,000 years ago, what difference does he have to make to us? Well, there are lots of things I could say about that, but let me just uh, mention one thing, and uh, hopefully on the screen, here we go, um, and um, uh, you might have come across H.G. Wells, who was a, a novelist uh, and a critic, a historian, 
Uh, he wrote various books like uh, The Invisible Man and War of the Worlds. I'm sure you've uh, heard of him, even if you haven't actually read any of his stuff. Uh, he once said this, I'm an historian, I am not a believer, but this penniless preacher from Galilee is irresistibly the center of history. Now that's uh, quite a claim. Um, we don't have time to sort of unpack all of the reasons why you might say that. Uh, I'm just going to start there, though. And, and, and my guess is that you're at least curious about Jesus, or you wouldn't be here. And as we use one of these sort of source texts that you, as, uh, has been mentioned, you can take away with you, Luke, um, we're going to sort of look at some of the things that he said and see whether they help us to think about what it means to be human, what it means to live life, why it might possibly be relevant uh, today, 2,000 years after uh, he said these things. Now, um, uh, what we're going to do, the way I've sort of broken it down each of these five evenings, I mean, there are lots of ways we could tackle it, but I've decided to take five different stories that Jesus uh, taught. He was known, he was loved as a storyteller. So, in a way, Luke compiles within the text of his book uh, you know, a kind of short story collection. And so we're going to look at one of these each night. They're sometimes known as his parables. Um, and I guarantee it, I guarantee that his stories will defy expectations, even the ones that you're perhaps a little vaguely familiar with. Perhaps this one is one that you've heard about, maybe you've even learned about at school. Well, the interesting thing is the context is that um, it's prompted by a lawyer who has come to Jesus with some tough questions. Now lawyers, I don't know whether we've got any lawyers present here, if, if there are, you are welcome. Um, <laughs> tonight. Um, no, but, uh, you know, lawyers are always poring over case studies, trying to sort of establish the ins and outs, you know, the boundaries of the law, seeing how it fits and how, how it should be applied and who gets off and, and so on. Um, and, and that's been going on for 2,000 years. Um, we find that that's what's happening in, in this story. I heard recently of a, a Californian lawyer, I think it would be California, as you can, will be able to see why, um, he was defending a murder suspect. And um, his strategy was to exploit what, at the time, was some confusion in Californian state law um, about when death actually occurs. This is actually quite a crucial point when it comes to a murder inquiry, as you would agree. And apparently, the law in California used to define death as when the heart stops beating. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, the lawyer's defense claimed that the victim was not, in fact, dead because his heart had been transplanted and was beating quite normally in somebody else, and so therefore his uh, uh, client was, was not guilty of murder, case solved. Well, I think that kind of mindset has been around for, well, literally thousands of years, and we'll see this kind of thing going on here. Uh, lawyers love playing with case studies, trying to figure out uh, where the law stands, and this case study of the neighborly Samaritan is a very interesting example. Jesus is showing that he can give as good as he gets. He can actually beat the lawyers at their own game. But here's another thing about lawyers. They're always posing what they hope uh, will be sort of, you know, entrapment questions. And this famous story in Luke 10, I think can only be understood when we see the questions that bookend the story because it's actually in the context of a conversation. Jesus tells a story in a conversation. And that conversation actually is profoundly significant for understanding what's going on. So, so just read with me. You can just see the little number there, verse uh, for 25 there at the beginning. Uh, an expert in the law wants to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Flick down to the end, verse 37, and the very last words of the passage that we have read, well, there's your answer. Go and do likewise. So those are like the bookends. What must I do? Do likewise. Well, like what? But, but here's the point. This man wants to do something to get to heaven. He wants to do something. So Jesus tells him. Follow the guy in the case study. So there's the answer in black and white. 
be good boys and girls and you'll go to heaven be good do something do this and you'll be fine but within this q and a is another pair of questions jesus asks for the summary of the law and uh, the Jewish law is uh, what we find in the first five books of the Jewish scriptures. We call it the Old Testament. If you're from a Christian background, the Jewish scriptures, the law, the first five books. And this Jewish lawyer, as you would expect, knows his stuff. He studied it. He's an expert. It's his day job. And so he gets a perfect answer. Love God, love your neighbor. There it is. Verse 27. Gets it absolutely spot on. A triple plus. And Jesus replies, verse 28, you've answered correctly. Well, of course he has. And um, he says, do this and you'll live. Do this. There it is again. This is what you've got to do. Get to heaven by being and doing good uh, or in the words of the law summary love love perfectly live a life of perfect love that's what you've got to do if you want to inherit eternal life or go to heaven or however you want to put it this is what you want you need to do now <laughs> lawyers are always thinking about the ins and outs so inevitably this is not good enough for this lawyer so he actually parries with another question there in verse 29. And, and actually, it's totally understandable, isn't it? In the, in the light of the agenda that he has, in, in the purpose that he, he has in asking Jesus these questions, he wants to know how to get to heaven. So it actually matters who I need to love. So there do you have it, verse 29. So who is my neighbor? That's the obvious question, isn't it? If, if loving, uh, loving my neighbor as I should, is a key, I want to know the answer. That is perfectly reasonable. Now, we know absolutely nothing about this lawyer. We, we don't know anything about what happened he was doing before. We don't hear of him again, as far as we know. Um, he's clearly no fool. He may even have been to Durham, you never know. And um, in verse... <laughs> 25, we're told that he is coming to test Jesus, and perhaps that's fair enough. Maybe that's just completely neutral. I mean, he wants to know the truth, um, so he has integrity in trying to figure things out. Fair enough. But actually, the biggest clue comes at the bottom of that page of verse 29. Uh, this is what Luke tells us about him. He wants to justify himself. <laughs> now, that's a sort of technical theological term that, that Luke uses there, but it simply means to be right with God, to be in God's good books, if you like. In other words, to be qualified for heaven. He wants to justify himself. And so therefore, you can see why doing is the operative word. What must I do to justify myself? Well, he wants to know so Jesus tells him. He takes him on, and as always, and we'll see this every night this week, Jesus always gives as good as he gets. The lawyer wants to do something. Jesus gives him something to do. So let's think about this case study that we sometimes know as the parable of the Good Samaritan, this legal case study, and figure out what we're talking about. What, what does he need to do to inherit eternal life? Well, there are three things I think that this reveals about qualifying love. The kind of love that God expects human beings to show to inherit eternal life. Let's see the first one. I call this love without excuses. You see, Jesus converts what, what begins as an assessment of his own legal know-how, he converts it into a kind of acid test of the lawyer's legal obedience. He's very subversive. 
Now, I, I don't know whether uh, you know much about the sort of geography of uh, Israel-Palestine, uh, but uh, even today it's still the same. The, the, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is exceptionally dangerous. In less than 17 miles, the road descends 3,000 feet. And it's quite remote and craggy, and actually, if you were inventing a sort of case study that involved a mugging, then actually this would be a brilliant place to put it. A solitary traveler walking down this road would actually have been easy prey. And so within minutes, this man is unconscious, he's hardly moving a muscle, and life is literally seeping away with his congealing blood. A truly gruesome scene, but apparently on this road, 2,000 odd years ago, a not uncommon one. And uh, if you were nearby or, or had some sort of access to it, you, you, you would have seen that, that the flies were beginning to buzz around the corpse. And, and perhaps high up in the sky, the vultures would have started circling. And if you'd seen the vultures far off, you, you would have known what was going on. You would have known what that signified. Except, this is no corpse, is it? <laughs> the man's alive. Get, get up close and you can hear the breathing, but only just. You need to get up close. Now, for all the dangers, apparently at this time, the Jericho Road was actually quite a busy one because uh, Apparently, many of the priests who lived, uh, who worked in the big, great temple of Jerusalem actually lived down in Jericho. The climate was uh, much better down there. It was much nicer. It was more fertile. It was a beautiful place to live. And so people, I guess, would be, you know, they'd have a week on, week off, or however it worked. And so they would be traveling down the mountain from Jerusalem to Jericho on their way after, I guess, a week's shift. Or something like that. And so priests traveling up and down this road were also a relatively common sight. It's not so weird at all. It's very credible. And verse uh, 31 explicitly tells us that a priest is going down this road. In other words, he's returning home from a shift in Jerusalem, in the temple. And it's always easier going downhill after work, isn't it? At the end of a day, at the end of a long week. And I guess, you know, we forget, don't we, that modern mod cons and, and sort of transport opportunities and everything else uh, show how easy it is. I lived for four years in East Africa. And one of the things that whenever we went up country, uh, I was in, in, we were living in Uganda, whenever you went up country, you could be in the middle of nowhere you know, miles away from the nearest town, but almost guaranteed, without fail, wherever you stopped, you know, if you needed a quick loo break, it's absolutely guaranteed somebody would appear in the middle of nowhere. There are always people, even in the remotest places. They'd be walking. And in Jesus' time, of course, that's pretty much the only option most people had. Walking for miles. So, just for a moment, put yourself in this priest's shoes. Busy week, tired, wants to get home, no doubt hungry, perhaps there's something good on the telly that night, wants to get back. He's walking down the hill. And as he makes his steady progress, I would imagine that the first thing he spotted was the vultures. And he knew what they meant. And he knew what that meant for him in his professional role. He actually knew that that was a sign, a risk. He knew his Bible. You see, the biblical law, the law that this lawyer who's talking to Jesus has summarized so well, made it very clear that contact with a corpse for a priest was a bit of a disaster. It made you ritually unclean. Even though that, of course, for us, is pretty hard to get our heads around that. That's not a sort of issue that I guess we're used to having to think about. But for this guy, this was his day job. 
He was having to think about this all the time because he had to be ritually clean in order to carry out his sacrifices and the business of the temple. This was his bread and butter. And, and, and so to be unclean meant that he was unable to do his job. And a corpse in this system was pretty much the biggest threat to cleanliness imaginable. Even a moment's contact was sufficient. And if he did become unclean, well, he'd have to turn around, make his way up, back up the mountain, go back to Jerusalem, and go through a whole load of rigorous and uh, awkward paraphernalia of going through the motions of having to become clean again. So, can you understand? He's not going to get involved. It's, it's frankly just not worth it, is it? What's more, it could be a trap. He could be a fraud, this guy lying in the ditch. He could have accomplices. This actually happened to some friends of ours in, in Uganda. They were up country. They saw somebody lying by the road who looked injured. They naturally stopped. And this guy's friends jumped out behind bush and stole their car. And they were just left there in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps that kind of thing went through this priest's mind. We can understand, can't we? So the priest walked straight past the corpse. I mean, who wouldn't? I would be tempted, wouldn't you? I can imagine the, the sort of the way he's thinking. I mean, you know, you look, the guy's dead anyway. It's not my job. I'm not a funeral director. I cannot afford to let a corpse make me unclean. Except it's no corpse. He's alive. But, but you'd only know that from getting up close. But the priest simply won't take the chance. I don't blame him, but he's not going to make the chance, take the chance. And so far from checking to make sure, he actually walks, Jesus makes it very explicit, doesn't he? He walks to the other side of the road. And who can blame him? He had every excuse in the book. The book happened to be the Bible. Well, next up in uh, verse 32 comes a Levite. Well, he was a, another temple employee, uh, but sort of junior in rank and role to the priests. And, and, and it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it, that Jesus is kind of working down the Jewish pecking order. Um, you know, priest, Levite is obvious. And I, I am sure his audience, the people who gather around to listen to him, I mean, they, they were there wherever he went. Uh, I'm sure they... They got the gist. I mean, you know, the kind of thinking, you just can't trust the leadership these days, you know. They don't care about anybody but themselves. You can almost sort of see the knowing glances around the crowd as they're standing listening to him. We, we know what you're doing, Jesus. The Levite was next because he's the sort of number two next on the, the pecking order. And guess what? No surprises here. He does exactly what the priest does. And again, who can blame him? He can't involve, uh, afford to get involved either. No wonder. So, so when we see at the end of the story Jesus saying, do likewise, we know, don't we, that in no sense was this lawyer meant to imitate the priest and the Levite. But I would imagine, and Jesus knew this full well, that the, this lawyer... He could have related to the priest and the Levite, don't you? I mean, I can relate to them. I'm sure you can. Don't get involved. Don't get involved with somebody who's dead. Except he's not dead, is he? He's alive. But only just. The Bible was a useful, convenient tool to give them excuses not to get involved. The Bible says nothing about touching somebody who's sick. Far from it. They need help. But don't we all do the same thing? Don't we find excuses? We, we justify our actions. Oh, I can't get involved with that, or I, I've got too many other things. And, and when we put our minds to it, 
And I know this full well for myself. When we put our minds to it, we can justify not doing anything. <laughs> we all are actually sort of closet lawyers, really. We can find lots of good things to do to avoid the inconvenient but perhaps morally right things to do. I know that of myself. They're just excuses, though. And after all, a, a dying man in a ditch is hardly a strategic use of my time, is it? Excuses not to love. But Jesus expects us to love without excuses. Love for our fellow man. Love, come what may, to whomever. Surely that's the morally right thing. But the story continues. We see, secondly, what I call love without boundaries. We've had a priest, we've had our Le uh, Levite. Well, we know what's coming next. You know, your average Jewish guy, Josh Bloggs, I suppose we can call him, or something like that. He'd be the good guy. So far, so predictable. But Jesus is never predictable. Never predictable. He doesn't go for a Jew at all. He goes for a Samaritan. Now that's outrageous. We, we don't know the half. We don't realize how outrageous that was. Jews and Samaritans, they had centuries of history. A bit like the French and the English. It went back a long way. This is outrageous. I guess for most of Jesus' Jewish hearers, you know, having a Gentile, a non-Jew, would have been better than a Samaritan. You've got to be kidding. I mean, I would imagine there's the sorts of things going through their minds. I mean, you know, so far, the story was pretty credible. We can believe it so far. And then suddenly, it just completely leaps off into fantasy. A Samaritan. They were a bunch of no good corrupt, stinking compromisers who are probably responsible for the mugging in the first place. You can't trust any of them. But that's where you're wrong. You can trust one of them, at least. Seems Jesus' point, doesn't it? You see, he realizes the man is alive. He, he gets up close. He does everything he can to help. Now, oh, allow me to get a little bit anatomical here. Notice that the dying man is naked. The, sea, the thieves stripped him. They took everything, including his clothes. So it would have been obvious to passers-by whether or not this man was Jew or Gentile. It would have been clear whether or not he had been circumcised, like the Jews and many Samaritans had been. If he'd been Gentile, a Samaritan, just like the priest and the Levite, would have had every excuse in the book to walk past. They don't mix. You don't get involved. Walk on by. Jews and Samaritans do not mix with each other, and nor do they mix with Gentiles, with non-Jews. But Jesus tells us nothing. We don't know anything about this man. We don't know his race. In fact, we know absolutely nothing about him. We don't know whether this man was Jewish, Samaritan, from Tashkent or Guadalajara or anywhere. We don't know. He doesn't tell us, which is precisely the point, because it is irrelevant. Couldn't care less where he is from. He is a man, a fellow human being who is dying. And every second counts. You see, this Samaritan shows love regardless of any prejudices that he might have felt. This love truly was a love that goes beyond boundaries. <coughs> Do likewise, what Jesus said. How do we match up? Love without boundaries, love that is colorblind, love that is deaf to accent, love that 
transcends every conceivable human barrier. And we've got lots. Whether it be of class, of race, of sexuality, of looks, of abilities, of bank balance, you name it. We erect barriers. And Jesus says love that goes beyond any and all. Where is the love for fellow humanity? Where is the love without boundaries? We talk a lot about all the things that we have in common as human beings. And, and um, you know, we, we thought a bit about some of those things at the beginning. All the amazing things about the human body and about human cultures and the things that we have in common that transcend cultures. I do a lot of work in many different cultures. And yeah, there are, of course, differences, but the thing that actually blows me away more often than not is the things that are not different. We talk a lot about equality in humanity. We talk, but we have to admit we're pretty lousy at living it out. Like John mentioned earlier, didn't he, that in some of the tragedies that he's had to deal with. You know, he's obviously witnessed some of the worst and some of the best of human beings. Well, actually, we find that in this story, don't we? Some of the worst and some of the best. Well, thirdly, we find love without accounts. You see, this Samaritan, he goes beyond the call of duty. Jesus' storytelling is vivid, isn't it? Look at verse 33. He came where the man was, right up close. In contrast to the temple officials. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. You see, this is not somebody who is thinking, he's feeling. This is not someone who is strategizing. He's overwhelmed. This man is dying. How could he not help? He picks him up, takes care of him. More than that, he doesn't just save his life. I mean, that would have been wonderful in itself. But he does everything to get him back on his feet. At great personal expense. And he uses up his sort of rudimentary first aid kit, which he had on him, you know, bandages, wine and oil. Uh, then he puts him up on his donkey. You know what that means, don't you? It means he's got to walk now. And he takes him to a hostel. I suppose he realizes he's going to need a bit more cash, goes to the net la local ATM, gets some money out, passes on two denarii to the owner. This is just for starters. Two denarii, that's, that's two months' rent. Just think about that. Two months' rent given to a complete stranger whose name you don't even know. It's a remarkable act of extravagant and practical compassion and love, isn't it? Love without excuses, without boundaries, without accounts. And we're told that when the that we're not told when the giving stopped. We're just told that, do you see? Look after him. I'll reimburse you if there's any more you need. He'll come back with more cash. Now, you may not realize this, and I don't think it's a fact that is widely recognized, but <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, uh, as prime minister, actually was something a bit of a, uh, an amateur theologian. Did you know that? <laughs> she uh, actually commentated on this passage. She said this, Nobody would remember the good Samaritan if he had only good intentions. He had money, too, which is true. But it's ironic, isn't it, that that was said in the 80s, which was a time in this country particularly that was known for sort of money grabbing, not money giving. Of course, the Samaritan had money. But he had something far more significant. He had love. Costly love. You don't have to be rich to have that, but you can be rich and not have that. What matters is what you do with your wealth. And it's profoundly challenging. This is, this is a, a legal case study with real punch, isn't it? But notice how Jesus concludes, and this is, this is strange. 
Because you see, we expect Jesus to ask a slightly different question at the end of his story. We would expect, in answer to the question first asked, wouldn't we? We'd expect, who is the neighbor? That, that's what prompted this story. Who is my neighbor? Well, our lawyer would have got the point. My neighbor, the guy in the ditch. And that would have enforced a kind of condemnation of the lawyer, of the priest and the Levite, uh, even though he would have undoubtedly sympathized with them. It's a tough pill to swallow, but he'd have accepted that. A dying man in the ditch, that is my neighbor. That is the kind of person I must love. But, you see, that is not what Jesus asked. Just have a look there at verse 36. He asks, who was a neighbor to the guy in the ditch, who acted neighborly? Now, that's a very different question. Do you see that? And again, the answer is simple. You, you, you know the answer. The lawyer knew the answer. He says, yes, uh, the one who had mercy. <laughs> but do you see, he cannot, he cannot even bear to mention the word Samaritan. That word kind of sort of sticks in his throat. The question isn't complicated to answer. It's just impossible to accept. It's too galling that a member of a hated minority could possibly be an exemplary citizen, a model to follow. And I guess it would be, I don't know, the equivalent of a highly respected human rights a lawyer passing by on the other side, while a convicted paedophile is the one who gets down and helps. That's the kind of outrage. That's, That's not right. right. Go and do likewise. And that's the end. It's the end of the story. We hear no more about the lawyer, so we've no idea what he thought afterwards. We don't know what the, how he responded. But he did get answers, didn't he? He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus says at the end, go and do the same. This is what you must do. Love like this. Do what the Samaritan did. Love without excuses, without boundaries, without accounts. So friends, that's the end tonight. Good night. It's been lovely having you. Love like this. If you want to get to heaven, that's what you've got to do. It's over to you. I don't know how that makes you feel. It makes me feel utterly terrified. Because it's too much. It's impossible, that kind of love, isn't it? I, I look at this and think, well, I try to be nice. <laughs> I try to love people, but I can't do it like that. Because actually, the story was credible until this Samaritan started working. Then you think, this is just unbelievable. No, I mean, do you know anybody who loves like that? Seriously? Gives, you know, months rent and more to look after a total stranger. What, how's he going to pay the rent now? But that's precisely the point. You see, this love is too much. Nobody is like that in real life. I cannot be like that. You cannot be like that. Or, or you can try and prove me wrong. I'm very happy for you to come back to me at the end of the week and say, I have loved like this. I look forward to talking with you on Friday. But actually, I think the reality is this exposes the fact that it is impossible to love like this. But here's the point, and this is the heart of the Christian message, and this is what I'm closing with. This is why we're putting on this week, because that is not the whole picture. Yes, there is one way to inherit eternal life, and that is to be good, to love perfectly. That is the fulfillment of the law, to love like this Samaritan. But there is an alternative, and that is what the Christian message is all about. You see, there is someone who does love like this. And that is the one telling the story. That's Jesus.
That is precisely what he claims. He claims that he dies on a cross precisely to love people who weren't just strangers but actually hostile to him, people who'd washed their hands of him, people who wanted to live independently from him. He's saying, I will die on the cross for you so that you can inherit eternal life. I will do for you what you could never do for yourself. You see, we have been loved by Christ, by Jesus of Nazareth, without accounts, without boundaries, without excuses. That is the heart of the Christian message. That is why we're here tonight and this week. And I hope that that is enough just to provoke further thought and inquiry, to ask the questions, as John encouraged us to do earlier to make the most of checking out whether or not this love really is possible as a gift, not a demand, from God. Thank you very much for listening, and see you again another night if you come.